Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Continuing this morning with Uddhava Gita, Canto 11, Chapter 9, starting with text 14. Some of you, most of you were with us yesterday, but a little, just a little background. This portion of Uddhava Gita is Krishna narrating to Uddhava uh, a story. And the story is something that he um, heard. Of course, he's omniscient, but he heard that their forefather, King Yadu, a previous king in the celebrated line of disciplic succession of kings, uh, had a discussion with a Avaduta Brahmin Here's a detail. Our acharyas consistently indicate this Abhaduta Brahman is Dattatreya. Hmm. Now it doesn't say that in the text, but our acharyas have reached that conclusion consistently, making reference to Canto to chapter seven, where a list of incarnations is presented and the description of Datta Treya includes, he gave transcendental teachings to Prahlad, to Haihaya, and to King Yadu and others. So he's giving transcendental knowledge to King Yadu. And the persons who he received his knowledge from are not the formal sense of gurus, like even a shiksha guru, but just he learned lessons from different, different, different gurus. So yesterday we concluded the section where he learned from an arrow maker. And this morning we're going to hear how he learned from a serpent. And previously, in the previous chapter, was a prostitute. So those aren't the normal kinds of persons that you consider gurus, but he is Dattatreya. <laughs> so he doesn't need to learn from anybody, but he's um, in referring to characteristics about each of them that have taught him detachment and imparted knowledge by their example. So if you want to learn from a serpent, here's, you can hear from Dattatreya or the Abhaduta Brahman speaking to King Yadu as narrated by Krishna himself. So we can take it as authoritative for sure. <laughs> Text 14, translation. Ekachari, a saintly person should remain alone. If you're an Abhaduta Brahman, that's what you're supposed to do. If you're a Jnani Tyagi, that's what you're supposed to do. We learned from the, the young girl with the bracelets, you stay in the association of devotees and that's staying alone. It's the same as what the Jnani does what the devotee does by keeping devotee association and hearing and discussing topics of Hari, that's staying alone, even better than this type. A stately person should remain alone and constantly travel without any fixed residence. Being alert, he should remain secluded and should act in such a way that he is not recognized or noticed by others. Moving without companions, 
He should not speak more than required. And Bhakti Siddhanta has made his slightly different translation. A saintly person should wander about alone without any companion and without a fixed residence indeed, just to avoid bad association, he should be careful so that he will not even be recognized by others. While traveling here and there, he should avoid speaking more than what is absolutely necessary. And the BBT purport reads, two paragraphs. The previous narration concerning the shell bracelets of the young girl demonstrates that even saintly persons engaged in ordinary yoga processes should remain alone to avoid conflict or disturbance. In other words, persons engaged in ordinary yoga processes should not even associate with each other. This verse indirectly refers to the serpent who, fearing attack from human beings, keeps himself secluded. From this example, we learn that a saintly person should not associate with ordinary materialistic people. He should avoid having a fixed residence and should wander unnoticed by others. Now, when we were reading about the, the young girl with the bracelets, um, she wasn't you know, a sadhu that's keeping herself renounced. She is a young girl about to be married, but um, same principle. So ashram specific, same principle. Our engagement in material existence is the cause of our unhappiness. That's like the theme of these three chapters. Such engagement destroys the real purpose of our life, Krishna consciousness. Somehow or other, one must give up the deep-rooted attachment to material society, friendship, and love. One must practice detachment and by surrender to the principle of Krishna consciousness, one's auspicious life will begin. By organizing one's life, according to the Varnashram system, one can take the first step in self-realization. In other words, one should accept an honest occupation and regulate his sex life either by giving it up entirely as a brahmachari or a sannyasi, or by living as a married householder. Without regulating one's occupation and personal life, there will be chaos, and it will be very difficult to make spiritual advancement. The attachments to material society, friendship, and love are based on a long previous experience in the material world. They are great obstacles in the path of transcendental understanding. And if one maintains them, spiritual progress will be most difficult. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught by his example and precept what a devotee should do and should not do. And obedience to such principles brings one to the path of supreme perfection. Thus, one has to rise above ordinary social custom which directs the living entity toward useless sense gratification. And here is Bhakti Siddhanta's purport. The propensity for material enjoyment is the cause of the living entity's distress. Bhagavad Gita, right? Yehi samsparsha ja boga dukkha yonaya evate. So this is an expanded Bhagavad Gita. The, the, this propensity for material enjoyment also covers his actual purpose of life. So it brings distress and it covers the purpose of life. Instead of opposing the previous, previously followed social etiquette, if one accepts it without attachment, then gradually he will achieve auspiciousness. When one follows the Varnashram system, he takes the first step of self-realization. One should work honestly and control this propensity for sexual enjoyment, either by completely renouncing it as a brahmachari or sannyasi, or by accepting the concession offered to the householder. Without regulating one's life, everything will be performed whimsically so that it will be impossible to make spiritual advancement. A person's attachment to society, friendship, and love 
as a great impediment on the path of spiritual elevation. If one maintains such attachments, progress will be very slow. You can see the disciples of Prabhupada followed very closely Bhakti Siddhanta's commentary in their own words, but Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us by his personal example what a devotee should and should not do. It is simply obedience to these principles that will lead one to the perfection of life. There's no use in ways of mundane society which simply directs us toward the path of sense gratification. So then there's Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary paraphrased by Bhakti Siddhanta, short. The lesson to be learned from the snake is herein described. The snake wanders about alone, out of fear of people, behaving in such a way that no one will notice it. An introspective sage should conduct his life in the same manner. And here's what Vishwanath Chakravarti actually writes. He, that's the Abhidutta Brahman, explains what he learned from the snake. The young girl is a guru for giving up even the association of other yogis. The snake is the guru for giving up association of material people. The sage moves about alone afraid of society with a fixed, without a fixed residence, always alert. He lives alone. He is unnoticed by the public, by his gait and actions. He has no companion and speaks little. And finally, here's Jiva Goswami from his Krama Sandarbha. Krama Sandarbha, most of you know, is one of his writings, one of his several commentaries on Srimad Bhagavatam, and Kramasandarbha is the verse by verse type, like Prabhupada did, verse by verse type. So that's Kramasandarbha. Still there's some form, because Sandarbha term means a certain form of composition, and it follows that form. So here's his commentary on this verse. A saintly person should remain alone and constantly travel without any fixed residence. Being attentive, he should remain secluded and should act in such a way that no one knows what is what he is doing. Moving without companions, he should not speak more than required. Paragraph. He should be attentive to his acts and conduct. Ah. Uh, Pramataha. He should behave in such a way that no one knows what he is doing. Alakshamanaha. Now, um, I think the Abhidutta Brahman is speaking from his own position in society which is um, not even within the Varnashram system. He's, he's an Avaduta. But he's renounced from association, female association, and for that matter, other association. Uh, to renounce from other association, one of the things we learned from the Pingala, section of the previous chapter is at least the commentary says some authorities say that uh, Dattatreya, the Abhidutta Brahmana, took rest in the yard of the prostitute and the prostitute lived in Videha or Mithila and so that's, that's a big city. So it's not, we should understand his moving alone doesn't mean he's always in the forest, although it doesn't mean he's not in the forest either. But he's not limited to forest life, nor is he limited to um, 
not sleeping in the yard of a prostitute or um, something like we hear about Lord Nityananda. There's a passage, as you know, in Chaitanya Bhagavat, where Lord Nityananda, before, on the way before um, traveling with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there was a, a so-called, forget the language that's used in the translation, but it's a so-called renunciate. And when he saw, Lord, Lord Nityananda saw him, so he went to visit and the so-called sannyasi had a girlfriend and he wanted to um, in, engage him in nectar and the nectar turned out to be alcohol. And Lord Nityananda didn't get, freak out and get up and say, you know, yuck, you're, you're a pretender. He wanted to deliver him. When Lord Chaitanya came to find Lord Nityananda, it was, yuck, I'm, I'm jumping in the Ganges with my clothes on to, uh, to purify myself from such unwholesome association. <clears throat> but Lord Nityananda wanted to deliver even the most fallen, even the so-called sannyasi renunciate, drinking alcohol and having a girlfriend. So it is said that Prabhupada, I've, was fond of re remembering this. If you see Lord Nityananda coming out of a liquor shop, you should understand that he went there to deliver the people in the liquor shop. So devotees who are practicing Krishna consciousness may also, on behalf, not on otherwise, but on behalf of Lord Chaitanya, to deliver the good news of Shuddha Bhakti by one method or another, by Harinam or book distribution or somehow or another, going into such places where abominable people are doing abominable things, or at least abominable things are being stuck on the, on the, in the lives of good souls that somehow by bad association are doing bad things. The, the, the protection is there, and the, the sanctity is there for the devotee. Even this, uh, being like this statement of the Avaduta Brahman is being afraid of materialistic association one keeps aloof. Just making the point because it's in the verse, our Sankirtan movement, the Ch Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Sankirtan movement doesn't stay aloof for the purpose of preaching. For the purpose of preaching, one is staying aloof by being an emissary of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission. It's not a small thing, it's an important thing. And our Sankirtan devotees, there's, my mind is, the pause was, my mind is going to so many Sankirtan stories where devotees have gone into like, wow, situations. And feeling the presence of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, wanting to distribute books, go into all kinds of places, go where there's police problem, go where there's meat, liquor, <laughs> this and that. And somehow, you know, the mercy of Lord Chaitanya descends. I mean, that all circumstances have that kind of happy ending. And it's not like we look for abominable situations to go to. But protection of Lord Chaitanya is there in the same manner as is being spoken by this Abhidutta Brahman, because that's his propensity. And he's not being, he's not on Sankirtan. He's not an emissary of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission. So he's being cautious in his way. But so supposing, I'll, I'll, here's one story. Um, Anybody in the room here knows Radha Balaba, Prabhupada disciple, Radha Balaba, Radha Balaba, who was, maybe you heard in the course of the Chaitanya Charitamrita two month marathon, he was the production manager, Radha Balaba. 
Now, before the BBT moved to LA, it wasn't BBT, it was ISKCON Press, and Radha Balaba was in New York, and he was one of the party leaders that every Saturday, everybody in the temple went out, and it was with, including the press, that was like 150 devotees. And that was a Sankirtan leader, and 150 devotees, 148, because I stayed back to coordinate everybody's everything with they had a problem or something. And um, the Pujari, and the, even the Pujari and Cook went after the Rajbog offering, they went out. And the temple president went out, everyone went out. The treasurer went out, everyone. There was nobody, there was two devotees in the building. 148 went out. So Radha Balava was one of the party leaders. And one of the things that they were doing, the innovative, is because it was a Saturday event, they came up with this really creative idea. And that was at night when everything else was shut down, they went to drive in movies, they knocked on the windows of people in drive in movies. And people are doing bad stuff in drive in movies. They, you know, these days, someone's going to pull a gun, they shoot you. But those days it was, and they distributed lots of books. And he came back one night really late and said, you know, we're protected by Lord Chaitanya. We go to this place and it's bad stuff people are doing. And we're protected. But then you know, go to Mangalarti and you know, on this side is the men, that side is the women, and one can easily be distracted by members of the opposite sex because we're not in Sankirtan. We're, 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 we're following the, the vidis of our bhakti practice. And when you're engaged in, in the reaching out to, as long as that's what's in the heart, now you can easily fall, fall prey to maya if you're not in that consciousness. But if you're in that consciousness, there's protection. Same protection is being described here by the Avaduta Brahman. I just wanted to make it connected. Then another point, because uh, in, in the commentaries, there's mention of the Pingala story and mention of the young girl's story, young girl with the bangles. So one of the, um, with, with the bangles story, she, she had many bangles and she's um, thrashing or removing the chaff from the rice padding. And to do it, there's a, there's a motion that was making a loud noise, so much so the possible potential men in the front where she, who she was preparing a meal for were hearing this loud noise. So she didn't, she was embarrassed. So she removed all but two bangles and she continued. And even with two bangles, it was making noise. She removed all but one on each wrist. And the commentary says, when you have unwholesome, shh, when you have unwholesome association, if you need to speak, you can go outside, but it's distracting. If you, um, if you have unwholesome association, then it's Kali Yuga, people are gonna, even wasn't Kali Yuga then, people are gonna quarrel. And even if it's two people, then there's gonna be some disagreement and some dissension. So this is the stay alone. And the, the commentary says, for one who is a, 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 a Gani, you have to stay alone. And if you're a devotee, you have association. But if you, if, then there's this transition that we all experienced. The transition by that I mean exactly what's in this. There's former ways that we used to live our lives because we grew up in a society where you do stuff. And you make friends that do stuff together. And that's your friend, that's your circle of... And then when you get a little older, like many of the persons take start up Krishna consciousness once they have their education and the family and stuff, they've got all their social circle. And sometimes people are caught between the expectations of their social circle and their life of devotion and the association of devotees. I mean, I don't, there's probably nobody in the room that hasn't been through that one. 
I went through that one <laughs> I'm from college. And you know, when I became a devotee, it was like, what? What happened to you? You become a fanatic. What's wrong? Well, you know, you're not fun anymore. And sometimes people would visit at the temple and there I was not fun anymore. And that was it. I didn't see them again or hear from them again. It was it, it was over. I mean, I wasn't saying don't come and see me, but I wasn't reaching out to, hey, come on over and see me either. Because I knew they were uncomfortable. Because I have different... So it, it, the, the, this teaching in this section is really practical stuff for people who take up the bhakti process. Now, the person who's being spoken to is Uddhava. And Uddhava is not, uh, you know, Bhakta Uddhava. But there are persons who take up the life of devotion and it's very relevant how to navigate your way through um, social expectations from others upon you, whether it's family members, or friends, or the companionship that you are have been accustomed to for some period of time during your life, and like what happens to all of that? There, there, there are different persons have different personalities and have different ways of navigating, but the principles are important to understand, and according to your nature and your circumstance, etc., navigate your way. But this, so a summary, this whole section, three chapters, is knowledge and detachment that help clear obstacles on the path of bhakti. Because that's the, the nature of the question that would have asked, and Krishna is doing a really good job of answering his question. How to remove, how to d diminish and remove um, the obstacles to know Krishna because it's an obstacle to maintain attachment to materialistic tendencies, material association, material social norms. You know, we're not recommended to become misfits and abhadutas, but how to put, put those things in their proper place and perspective as we're moving towards an important goal, life's goal to connect with Krishna, to know Krishna, to be with Krishna in all that we do. That's text 14. Here's a, something on the screen here. This is from yesterday. I didn't show this particular image, I don't think. One who is completely absorbed in loving devotional service to the absolute truth, Sri Krishna, no longer pays attention to mature illusion. So there she is, Maya personified, not distracting Haridas Thakur because he's fixed. And the image for this today's verse, text 14, our engagement in material existence is the cause of our unhappiness. Without regulating one's occupation and personal life, there will be chaos and it'll be very difficult to make spiritual advancement. These teachings aren't unique to uh, Vaishnava life or Bhagavatam's teachings. They're, they, they, their expression of them is common in different, different, different teachings, even in atheistic teachings. Um, I say that specifically with the thought in mind that in China, they have all kinds of, you know, wisdom personalities and they teach these things, but there's no theism involved. There's no goal of connecting with God. It's like, you don't talk about God. <laughs> these people don't talk about God. You know, they're, they're celebrated and they're, and they're promoted by the government. They want people to connect with, you know, 
virtuous life that's atheistic, that fits with communism. So they promote it. It's partly like, you know, an antidote for theism. Shri Shri Radha Nila Madhava Ki Jai. So when we're hearing these, it's just, we should not stop at the knowledge and detachment level, but the knowledge and detachment does have its place in the life of bhakti, obviously. Otherwise, Krishna is not going to be teaching it. So it's implicit, <clears throat> if not explicit. See if there's some discussion. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Nice to get your association. I was listening to the lecture and you mentioned about being solitary or, or keeping with your own self and your own company. And basically it's a lot of it seems there's a lot of external disturbances all the time. There's a lot of what? Uh, external. Uh, Maybe take the mask down while you speak. And then I... uh, thank, thank you. <laughs> I can breathe now. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of external disturbances that occur that you know, we're trained to uh, you know, defend against, but then also the anarth is something that's internal with ourselves. Yes. How do we handle that? What was the punchline? How to deal with that? Yeah, your anarth the anarth is within us. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm very familiar. So now the question is how to deal with it? Yeah, but you're, you're defending the external. And well, um, one affects the other and you, you help something out here and it helps something in here. You help something in here and it helps something out there. If you don't attend to that out there, it's, it's going to negatively impact, it's going to inflame the anarchist within. So both are, both are required and the, 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 the anarcha and the process you know what that one is. Chaita Dharpa Namarjanam. That's the Anartha Navriti process. Now, it doesn't mean just chant and you don't have to pay attention to the Anarthas within. It's just like they're just going to vanish. We, we should be aware of tendencies that are impure or offenses that are lead to the Anarthas. We should be aware and we guard against offenses, but that can be internal, not just external. So there's the anarcha nivritti process to deal with the impurities within. Or in the language of the Bhagavatam, that's in the language of chanting of the holy name. Um, in the language of Bhagavatam, the abhadras, vidhunoti, they're cleansed by hearing Harikata or hearing Srimad Bhagavan, Bhagavat Kata, Srinvata Srakata Krishna, Punya Shravana Kirtana, Riddhyan Taksto Yabhadrani Vidhu Noti Sarit Satam. So the combination of chanting and hearing transcendental topics of Krishna helps us to become aware of what those anarchas are. I mean, everyone's very familiar with this. Before we were devotees, we had no clue. When we became devotees, it's like, yuck, look at all that. So that's, that's good to re recognize the yuck and then continue with the cleansing process and you know, put, put something on the other side of the pan scale instead of the, you know, the, the nature of offenses, you do the opposite because now you know what it leads to and where it comes from. So that's the, that's the short mini of the Narcha Nivriti process. Okay. So that's, the, that's the, the fire, and then you have to like manage the fire. Excellent. Thank you very okay. much.
Sarva. Nask, Nask, just while you speak, if that's okay. It seems the Leela of Lord Ram, which stresses ideal Vedic behavior and Dharma, it seems like it would have a, a better effect in people's adherence to Dharma than... Speak into the microphone, because I'm having a hard time here. It seems like Lord Ram's... Lord uh, Brahma? His example of, of ideal behavior in, this, in the Ramayana and so forth is... Lord Rama. Yeah, Ram. Oh, I thought you said Brahma. Lord Rama. Yeah. Is an example of ideal behavior, for sure. Yeah. And the Mahabharata, it seems easier to misinterpret or, or to... Uh, for a person in Kali Yuga to act against Dharma because there seems to be not as much ideal Dharma. So microphone is drifting again. He let him hold it. Your 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 gesturing hand is distracting you from speaking into the microphone. Okay. <laughs> so maybe you could just comment on. It seems like that the example of the Ramayan of the ideal behavior is would be good for Kali Yuga. Oh, yeah. Whereas in Kali Yuga, people could more easily deviate if they, fought, if they use the Mahabharata or Krishna's activities as an example. Could, could you comment on that? Well, I'll, I'll comment in a couple of ways. One might interpret what you're saying was, you're saying is, Krishna made a boo boo. I, I'm not saying that you're saying that. I'm not saying, so it can be misinterpreted to conclude that you're saying Krishna made a boo boo. He should have done his, um, Leela of appearing as Lord Ram in, in Kali Yuga because, but he made his appearance in Dwarpa Yuga, and now what follows Dwarpa Yuga is people have a, have a tendency to become corrupted and deviated and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. The 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 message of Ramayana is for all time. Ram says to Hanuman, and Brahma says to Valmiki, that this will last as long as the, the oceans are there, and you know, as long as there's a creation, Ramayana will last. So it has its force throughout all the ages, throughout all of time, the emblem of, of virtue. And, you know, outside of the Hare Krishna movement, I don't know which is more popular. I wouldn't, you know, is Mahabharata more popular or Ramayana more popular? I don't know. I don't know how, how to survey something like that. But certainly there are persons who um, have great appreciation for Ramayana amongst theists and just just religious people in general. I, I, you know, just from traveling, children know Ramayana better than they mo know Mahabharata. The Hare Krishna children. They know Ramayana better than they know Mahabharata. And they can tell the, the stories. They know Krishna book stories too, but they know Ramayana like really well. You know, in general, some more so than Mahabharata. And that's in ISKCON, what to speak of outside of ISKCON. So it, it has its place, but why, why is it that um, there's emphasis, not so within ISKCON at least, not so much in Mahabharata, but in Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, because Krishna is revealing everything. And what to speak of revealing everything, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu reveals 
the essence of what's in Srimad Bhagavatam because that can be misunderstood. Krishna is this and that. But he reveals. He reveals even what Shukadeva Goswami doesn't reveal. So we want to encourage people to understand Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his teachings, his life and teachings. And that takes care of everything. How many people are going to want to follow a life of virtue? How many people are going to want to know what the goal of life is? But we, so we, we teach both. And towards what end? Not just be virtuous, because many people. I've had, just a little sharing, Sarva. I've had, you know, explicitly in the past three weeks, several people, adults, say that one of their obstacles in bhakti life is doing things with the understanding that I'm going to get some punya points. And with those punya points, I'm going to prosper. And that's, you know, that's the training that I received from childhood. And I, I understand that as an obstacle. But it's, so it's, in, so everything, the whole, the whole shebang can be an obstacle. Material existence, virtuous or otherwise. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu doesn't look at virtuous or otherwise. He looks at drawing attention to Krishna. Therefore, our, our emphasis is most of all upon Lord Chaitanya and Lord Yatananda. Most people don't know Lord Chaitanya and Lord Yatananda. They know materialism or they know virtue. They don't know transcendence. And, and yes, uh, materialism is abundant. <laughs> Sense gratification and primitive activities is, you know, that's, that's this middle planetary region, and especially in Kali Yuga, it's especially prominent. That's the field. And in comes Lord Chaitanya and his army, delivering transcendence in the midst of all of that. Therefore, the chanting of the holy name and Krishna Prashadam are our, two of our most important weapons. Anything else? Guru Maharaj. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, now, the, the word seclusion in this purport where for a saintly devotee, we understand a saintly devotee, as you mentioned, fully represents Mahaprabhu, Nityananda, and his heart and mind is uh, connected with the Lord. So he's protected every moment because he's fully dependent. Now we have the other side of the pyramid, uh, which is practicing sadhakas, you know, where we're striving, uh, the modes are still there, the modes keep switching. So for us, the word seclusion means kind of, I'm trying to understand, it's like drawing some boundaries when we interact. Yes. With, okay, thank you. We, we, Yes, a, a very um, helpful resource for householders to understand how to navigate the obligations of household life and worldly association in the workplace, marketplace, etc. is in Bhakti Minot Thakur's writing because he was a householder and he understood it. And two places that are particularly helpful, very, very specific, there's many, but two places that are really easily accessible are in Bhakti Loka, which is Bhakti Vinod Thakur's writing of the six and the six from Isho, from, from Nectar of Instruction. And in both of the six, there's uh, some um, association of worldly people. And he gives very practical instructions for householders. You know, uh, sannyasis are renouncing as this, householders that. Very practical. It's just, it's a thumbnail, but there's principles. And then one can apply principles in one's life.
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for the class. Um, <clears throat> how can one guard against, um, I guess, what is the word I was looking for? Just kind of me me mechanical regulation when we're regulating our lives. And maybe at first it, there's some juice or something that's very nice, but then in time it seems like it just kind of becomes mechanical. How can one guard against that? Well, there's the, 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 the plus and the minus, or the do and the do not. The do is the most powerful. The, the, the most powerful do is um, same as the discussion yesterday, but sankalpa. Like, what's your intention? And if, you, if you're distracted from intention, what, where, what's that space? It's the mechanical space or using another word, is the space of indifference. And from the space of indifference, the next step, like boom, boom, domino, it becomes attraction to the temporary. In that mechanical or indifferent space, the door is open and in comes Maya. And then it's, you know, then it's a struggle. And then we, oh, here I am in Maya again. So then you go back. But the, the, to stay not in the indifferent zone or the mechanical zone, or another word is complacency. There must be, there must be the positive. So beware of the negative and stay with the positive. And the positive is your, your, your purpose. If you're not clear what the purpose is, you're, you're, you're prone to be in this complacent zone, mechanical zone, indifferent zone, you know, we're lazy. We like to be comfortable, and that once we're comfortable, we're complacent. And that is mechanical. So there's, you have to go beyond. You must. Must. And then even going beyond, we, we can, using Bhakti Siddhanta's language, one can then slacken. He speaks about that specifically in terms of initiation. After, you know, one gets really committed and takes shelter and receives mercy and gets initiation, and then submission slackens. So his word is submission. I'm using another word, but yes, it comes to the same thing. Your intention, your sankalpa. Why are you doing this? And if that, if that bhakti muscle is not exercised on a regular basis, it'll become weak. So that, that's the protection. I heard, Maharaj, also that uh, on earlier time when we joined ISKCON movement, I heard from my Guru Maharaj that following the pious activities and the virtues is actually very detrimental to make the advancement in spiritual life because you feel that you are acting according to Manu Samhita or whatever the regulatory process but you will miss the goal. So it's really a curse to have live just a past life. It, to have real, what was the last word? Vir virtuous life? Pious, 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 pious life. life. Yeah. Pious life. A comment, uh, Prabhupada speaks on this point commonly um, is,
There are a few verses in Bhagavad Gita and a few verses in the Bhagavatam that Prabhupada spoke a lot about in different, different, different places. One of those is this one, uh, Dharmasya hi apavargasya nartotayopakalpate. Dharma should never be performed for, you know, aggrandizement of the benefits that come from Dharma. And if benefits do come from Dharma, they should never be utilized for material enjoyment, but they should be utilized in service to the Supreme Lord. Like he spoke about that a lot, like maybe 10, 10 times in different cities around the world. And he, he was very consistent what you're saying. Then he would say, you know, go to, into the whole thing of, you know, the Christians say, pray to God for our bread. And so, so that's good, but better than good is better than good is you don't ask for anything. So the expectation of the fruits of piety is the problem. It's not the piety. The enjoying spirit is the problem instead of offering to Krishna. And then you know, invariably Prabhupada would go to the Upavarga. And that's the purpose. Ultimate liberation, not just liberation, ultimate liberation, what's that? In, in, in service to the Supreme Lord, ultimate liberation, service to the Supreme Lord, eternal, without expectation. Okay. Let's see if there's something online. Our online folks feel neglected if we don't pay attention to them. Um, we have two questions from uh, Uttama Bhakta Prabhu. Okay. First one is knowledge that arises from bhakti is being understood by me as being what? Being understood by me as realized knowledge. Is that correct? Depends. Not necessarily. Let's just say uh, we all would agree we're spirit, soul, not this body. Is that knowledge or not? It's knowledge. How much realization do we have on that one? And how much do we live our lives consistently on that one? Not so much. So they're both knowledge and one is knowledge, one is theoretical and the other is realized or principle and, um, and realized. His second question is, if a householder really likes and loves Krishna, but at the same time also likes to associate with people of worldly mentality. Of which mentality? Worldly. Worldly mentality. I feel it will come out victorious based on the first principle. Is that a fair assessment? Well, the first principle will be uh, impeded by the second one. When you throw a wet blanket over a fire, it doesn't burn very well. Or just sprinkle water onto a fire, it doesn't burn very well. So it, it'll, it'll diminish the impact of the first one. Now, if, his, if, if you want to modify that and say it'll turn out well, uh, what the, the slackening of the appreciation of worldly enjoyment if it can move to the position of, I am, you know, Lord Chaitanya's messenger. I am, my existence is, <clears throat> as a servant of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, my existence is to bring people to Lord Chaitanya or bring people to Krishna. And if that's your consciousness, it's not enjoying the company of worldly people, but it's, being a mission representative of Lord Chaitanya to bring remembrance of Krishna to these people. Now, that can look, look uh, or it can take the shape in different, different ways according to different, different individuals. But that consciousness must be there for it to turn out to, as 
Uttama Bhakta is indicating. Next. Question from Archana Vaidya. She asks, can you kindly elaborate on the line in the last slide about regulating one's occupation and personal life? I am seeking a better understanding of this point. Well, keeping it simple because of the, the time it is this morning. As a householder, you have duties and you perform your duties according to the vidhis or the regulations of sadhana bhakti. And you know what those vidhis are for you as a householder and you follow them. And you know, you avoid, you minimize disturbances in those regulations. Um, you know, there's certain ones you just don't cross the line and some that say, you know, what you will eat and so forth and so on. And then there's other things that regulation, depending upon what's going on in, in your family or in the community, you may have to be flexible with your regulated schedule and so forth. But you have your, you know, the, the bedrock of your regulation of your, the, the do's and do nots. That's that's the in indication of regulation. Since one is time, and the you know vidis initiate us, the do's and the do nots. That's it. Shri Prabhupada ki. Yeah.